These two boys are survivors of an extraordinary crime. Jordan witnessed the moment when his younger brother Elijah was stolen from his mother's womb. They just came and uh, killed him and took out Eli and they were taking him out. He got stuck and he's, it was a miracle that uh, he didn't, that he survived. That's why they call and that's why they call him the miracle baby. I think that is like cruel. I mean, she should go have her own babies. My mom was doing a good job taking care of us and she's caring gonna, for everybody. And she's gonna have. It's not right to take somebody's life away for a baby or something. Chicago, 1995. An investigation into an already horrifying multiple murder has taken a particularly disturbing turn. In Addison, Illinois, police continue to investigate an especially gruesome triple murder. When a pregnant 28-year-old Deborah Evans, her 10-year-old daughter, and 8-year-old son were found murdered. Another son, 19 months old, was found unharmed. It is a case that has left the small community stunned. We are deeply grieved, and Father, we are outraged. We need to pray for the violence that has erupted in this town. The allegation is that, that during the course of her murder, these individuals removed the live infant child from her womb. She was full term, she was pregnant, she was expecting a baby and uh, she was murdered for her baby. They cut the baby out of her while she was dying. So she actually watched them while she was dying cut the baby from her. Deborah Evans and her three children had recently moved to Addison, a small town at the edge of Chicago. Her younger sister, Wendy, lived nearby with her four boys. The two families were close. Actually, the last time I had seen her, we had gone up to the mall to take the smaller kids trick-or-treating. She dressed up as a clown, you know, with like silvery, you know, like uh, the iridescent, like the purple and the pink and stuff, hair and stuff, and I didn't dress up. And uh, she, but she always participated. I mean, she had her face painted and everything, and she's like mega pregnant. This video is how the family likes to remember Debbie filmed six years before tragedy struck. Debbie is singing cheerfully on the soundtrack. But behind this sunny video is a woman who had a tough life. Money was tight and she moved home often. And by the time she was 28, Debbie had three children by different men. Samantha, Joshua and baby Jordan. Jordan's father was black, a detail that would later become relevant. We come from a poor background and uh, even though Debbie didn't have anything, she still tried to, uh, to help people. She was a very outgoing person, a very forgiving person. She was kind of uh, had a lot of expectations of what she wanted to do, and she loved her kids. I mean, everything was, was her children, her children. So things really were looking really well for Debbie, and her outlook was, was bright. In the early hours of November the 17th, 1995, Debbie's sister Wendy got a phone call. It would change the family's lives forever. So I jumped up and I grabbed the phone and it was James, Debbie's boyfriend. Everybody else was like, oh, they figured, you know, when somebody called that, you know, she was having the baby early or something. And uh, I'm like, hello, what are you talking about? And he's like, Debbie's dead. He's like, I came home from work and Debbie was dead. She was lying on the floor. She was all wide open and, and I still just wasn't getting, I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, she was cut, she was cut. And I'm like, what do you mean she was cut? He's like, and Samantha's dead and I'm like, 
what are you talking about? Sam, Debbie's father, was at the hospital taking care of a relative when he got the call. About five o'clock in the morning, the nurse came in and she said, uh, you have a, a call. Sounds like an emergency. That sounds like you need to take this phone call. So I walked down to the nurse's station and uh, took the phone call. And I just, I was, I was crying and, and he's like, what's the matter? And I just started bawling. It was almost a relief hearing his voice made me feel better. And at the same time, horrible, because, you know, how do you tell, you know, your dad? And uh, I told him, I said, Dad, um, I started to tell him exactly what James had said to me. Debbie's dead, Samantha's dead, and we cannot find Joshua. And I said, what? Are you kidding? She's always no, Dad, and she repeated it. He said he fell to his knees. It was probably, that phone call was probably the most painful thing I've ever had to do. Especially with us being so close. I, I can't imagine, um, and, and I can't express just how I felt, but it was just, it was totally devastating. The police found 10-year-old Samantha's body in her bedroom. She had been stabbed. 19-month-old Jordan was found deeply distressed but alive. He had been at the side of his dead mother and sister for six hours before help arrived. Debbie's oldest son, eight-year-old Joshua, was found 48 hours later in an alley. He too had been murdered. You could not <laughs> have bottled up the horror that ran through my home. A shocked America was left wondering who could have committed such a terrible crime. And what had happened to the baby? Police mounted a massive operation in search of the child cut from Deborah Evans' womb. She had already named him Elijah. It was two days before the police had a breakthrough. A tip-off led them to a nearby neighborhood where a woman had been seen showing off a newborn baby. The source suspected that the baby was not hers. Elijah was found alive and unharmed in the arms of this woman, Jacqueline Annette Williams. This was a cold, calculated, preconceived plan to kill not one person, but multiple people in order to take an infant child. It's horrible. I mean, it's, it is about as bad as the human condition gets. It doesn't get much worse. It's about the bottom. It's as evil and as dark and as black as it gets. Neighbors and friends at a makeshift memorial wonder why anyone would want to murder Deborah Evans and her kids and how the baby she was pregnant with managed to survive. The question is why. I did go back and stood outside, and just, just stood there looking at the place, and just kind of relived it over and over again, just to try to understand what, what had happened and what took place. It was just kind of a part of something I felt responsible to do for the boys and myself. She was going to, uh, I was going to get out of her stomach Friday, Grandpa told me, but go to the doctor's office and she was going to have me Friday. He doesn't know, we don't know the date. No, because... 
November 16th was the date, was the date that she got killed. Baby Elijah survived for one reason only. He was what the killer wanted. That's my baby, shouted Jacqueline Annette when police rescued Elijah. Investigators discovered that she knew her victim well. The lady that was involved in, in killing her, uh, Debbie knew her and had actually taken her in at one point with her children to help her because she didn't have a place to stay. Jacqueline Annette and Debbie had much in common. They were the same age, they both had three children, and Jacqueline claimed that she too was expecting a fourth child. It was due, she said, at the same time as Debbie's. What Debbie didn't and couldn't know was that Jacqueline was not after a friendship, but a baby, her baby. She was the ultimate con woman and a fairly bright lady, articulate. She was very deceitful, manipulative. She was able to convince people that she was actually pregnant. She did everything possible to, to, to tell everybody, this is my baby. Uh, before the child came into the world. This was not a crime that took place overnight. They didn't decide one day and two days later go and do it, or that day do it. This was months in the planning. Jacqueline maintained the fiction of her pregnancy for nine months. She put on over two stone. In the week before her supposed due date, she held a baby shower. She even registered the baby for state aid and named him Fidel Jr. after her boyfriend. When Debbie was pregnant, she was pregnant by a black man, so the baby was mixed. The woman involved, Annette, she wanted another baby that um, was going to be fair-skinned because her boyfriend was black but very, very pale. She couldn't have any more. She already had like two or three kids of her own and she'd had her tubes tied. And they wanted another baby that she was going to have that would resemble her boyfriend. That was the whole reasoning behind it. Police arrested Jacqueline Annette Williams' boyfriend, Fidel Caffey. His family all came to his defense in television interviews, blaming Jacqueline Annette. Annette was very possessive of Fidel. She was getting real big, so she told Fidel the reason why she was getting big because she was pregnant. Fidel told her, if you don't show me no baby, then I'm going to leave. Fidel Caffey himself also claimed he was just a fall guy, but the evidence was all against him. Hey, they framing us. We didn't do it. The police also arrested Jacqueline's cousin, Laverne Ward. In a horrible twist, it turned out that Ward was Debbie's ex-boyfriend and the father of both her 19-month-old son, Jordan, and the stolen baby, Elijah. That's what the crime was all about. It was about um, her and Fidel Caffey getting that child and the willingness of someone to help them uh, do a horrible, horrible crime. And uh, that was Laverne Ward, who already had a very strained relationship with Deborah Evans, and uh, it explains his willingness to participate. The three of them just were a deadly combination. They were all convicted on three counts of first-degree murder. Jacqueline Annette Williams will spend the rest of her life in prison. What I really wanted to see was, was remorse from her. I wanted to hear I'm sorry, no remorse, no, uh, no I'm sorry, just cold, cruel looks, just, you know, like, it was almost like, uh, so. People say, well, don't you think she's just a sick lady? I don't think she was sick, I think she was just, I think she's just evil. This case just defies imagination and there's, that's why hopefully it'll never be repeated. It's, it's the worst of the worst when it comes to this type of crime.
Tuscaloosa, Alabama, 700 miles south of Chicago. Just four months after the murder of Debbie Evans, another woman's body is found with major abdominal wounds. The Assistant Attorney General noticed alarming similarities with the Chicago case. I remember thinking something that bizarre couldn't happen in such close proximity and time, and particularly here in our state. This was something I don't think anyone would ever could have imagined could happen. It was so obscene, it was so sickening, it was so cold and calculating and so cruel. A man walking in the woods discovered the body of a young woman hidden in a ravine. Police identified the murder victim as missing teenager Carithia Curry. The 17-year-old had just finished high school. She lived with her mum in Tuscaloosa. It transpired that when she went missing, she was nine months pregnant. Once Carithia was found with her abdomen slit open, there was no, no doubt as to what happened. Then all the other pieces of the puzzle started coming together. I remember we found a pamphlet in there that somebody had probably gotten from either a doctor's office or the health department that was talking about giving birth, a giving birth type uh, pamphlet. And I remember looking at it and opening it and I had my gloves on and I was turning through it and it actually showed the C-section. I thought to myself, this is her instruction manual. You know, this is it. She had this and this is what she did it off of. and. She, this is what she looked at, I guess, right before she did what she did. Uh, and then probably the most profound thing we found in there was some razor blade wrappers. After a tip-off, a 37-year-old mother of two was arrested. Her name was Felicia Scott. When police found her, she was curled up on a sofa, cuddling a newborn baby. It took two years for the case to come to trial. During that time, the prosecution team sifted through a mountain of evidence, looking for anything that might provide the jury with a motive. In Felicia's background, there was absolutely no sign that she was capable of committing cold-blooded murder. None. And that's what drove me nuts for months, because I said there has to be something. She grew up in a normal way. She attended school. She did all the things your normal person would do. And she still was able to do something this sickening and horrific. During Felicia Scott's trial, the prosecution's evidence revealed a number of parallels with the murder of Deborah Evans in Chicago just months earlier. Felicia Scott, like Williams, had gone to great lengths to convince people she was pregnant. She'd put on weight, she'd told people she needed bed rest, she had even bought nappies and baby clothes in preparation for the new arrival. At last, psychologists and psychiatrists began to see a pattern in the behavior and character of women who killed other women for their babies. Fetal abduction with cesarean homicide is an extreme case to begin with that often um, in the several cases identified, involves elements of targeting a physically vulnerable victim, exploiting trust, causing grotesque suffering, being indifferent to the suffering of another. Psychiatrist Michael Wellner is undertaking a study to build up a profile of offenders and the dynamics of their crimes. The only key element that we see consistently coming up is that there seems to be some relationship, either present or very recent, um, that's been severed or endangered. And that, in the end, what the perpetrator ends up with is a baby. At Felicia Scott's trial, it emerged that she was trying to salvage a relationship with her boyfriend, Fred Polian. His friends testified that he had proudly announced that he was about to become a dad. At work, he had a framed copy of a baby scan given to him by Felicia. She had stolen it from a pregnant friend. 
Frederick Polian, according to the evidence we had, was very interested in having a child. Felicia was separated from her own husband. She had two older children, and she was very afraid, I think, that if she did not produce a child for Fred, that he would leave her. Felicia Scott was grooming Carithia Curry, the victim, to be the vessel for this child that she would need in order to hang on to Fred Polian. But while this offered a possible motive, psychologists still struggled to understand how a woman who has never exhibited any signs of violence could commit such a brutal crime. Psychologists who assessed Felicia found that she was not insane, but she did have a personality disorder. Narcissism so extreme she could not appreciate the suffering she had inflicted on her victim. She showed absolutely no empathy for Carithia Curry at all. Not in any interview she gave, not in anything she said during her trial when she testified. Carithia was a non-entity from beginning to end. I don't really think she even cared that much about the child. She had narcissistic tendencies, which means it was all about her. Everything, the world revolves to satisfy Felicia. It was me, 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 I, I, I. You can't credibly make any argument that this person is crazy because there's so much organization involved. There, there's so much subterfuge, there's so much calculating, there's this manipulation, this is the deception. These are not the actions of someone who's highly disorganized and crazy. Dr. Catherine Ramsland is one of America's leading forensic psychologists. She specializes in the workings of the criminal mind and has written over 25 books on this subject. I think what women who are doing this crime have in common is that mentality that stalkers have. It's narcissistic. It takes no account of the victim. It is about creating a delusion in which um, people are moved around as pawns and, do, and have lost their humanity. So, so the center of it is narcissism. And when it doesn't work out, they will feel victimized themselves. They will get this poor me mentality. Um, look what happened to me. They will blame others. They will have no sense of another person's feelings and uh, will use lies and conning and deception freely. I think she's one of the ultimates in that. I mean, there's nothing good in that woman. There couldn't be anything good in her. She, to this day, hasn't told the truth. Since Felicia Scott was sentenced to life, there have been five cases of fetal homicide by cesarean section. None of the women have ever admitted their guilt. They continue to deny their role. And this makes it hard to really understand their motives. I think it's crucial to meet the offender. She is going to be the most informed witness for what led to her ideas of what to do and on that day. Whether she chooses to be informative is another matter. Until June 2004, all recorded cases of fetal abduction were in the United States. But then it happened again in Girardot a small Colombian town three hours southwest of the capital, Bogota. This is the woman accused of the crime, Luzmila Fierro. She is in prison on remand. She is the first person to talk on camera about carrying out fetal theft, although in her mind, she is the victim, not the culprit. It all began during a visit to the local hospital when she noticed a young pregnant woman in the waiting room. That day, I went to the hospital and sat down in the waiting room. I had been there for a while when a woman approached me. She started talking to me, asking if I had any children. 
She told me that she had lots of problems with her husband, that her husband hit her, that her relationship with her husband was going really bad. Then she said she wanted me to do her a favor. The favor she wanted was for me to take out her baby. Simply put, she said that I was a good person, a noble person. She said that at the hospital. We were there talking for ages and I kept saying no, that I couldn't do that. And she said yes, yes, I could. That nothing was going to happen to me and that everything would be all right. And that perhaps I could take care of the baby because the husband was going to leave her. And what happened next? Well, at that moment... She had a... She had a cesarean. Did you know how to do it? No. Not at all. But uh, she kept telling me that uh, there was no danger, that I should be guided by a scar of a cesarean she had in the past. And what did you do at that moment? Well, um, with a blade, I cut her. And then the baby came out. The only thing she said was, let me see it, let me see it. Then I saw it to her. And she held my hand. After that, I went home with the baby because I wasn't just going to leave it there. Is what you said the truth? This is the most important part. It is alleged that Liz Miller drugged her victim with burundanga, a sedative used in date rapes. This might be one of the factors that led to this case being different in one crucial respect from all previous ones. The violence of the attacks has always killed the mother. Until now. Incredibly, this time the young mother survived. Her name is Solangela. This is her story. I went for an appointment in the hospital. Then I went to get some water for my daughter and myself. I bought a glass and left it on top of the table. Then I went to the toilet. And when I came back, I drank the water. After that, I don't remember anything. I lost all my memory. This is the moment when police believe Solangela was slipped a drug. It was around noon. Her next memory is six hours later when she woke up in the woods. At her side was her two-year-old daughter, Nicole. 
My child started screaming. She was waking me up. As I was waking up, the girl said, Mom, she's going, she's going with the baby. I sat down and my stomach was empty and bleeding. Then my daughter said, Mom, the lady left running with the baby. When the girl woke me up, I saw Luzmila's face, but a bit blurred. Nicole's shouts of distress saved Solangela. It gave her the strength to drag herself to a nearby house. Close to death, she was rushed to hospital. They took me to hospital. The doctors closed my belly and asked me questions, but I had no answer. The doctor who operated on me said that he found leaves, sand and stones inside my womb. The doctor was scared. He said it was a miracle because I was bleeding a lot. I don't think a sane person could have done something like this. For example, she would have had to put her hand into the uterus, taken hold of the fetus, well, the baby, and its placenta. This is so cruel, traumatic and aggressive. It is very difficult to take in, especially from a medical point of view. Here we perform operations like this every day, but in a sterile, medical setting. I think Solangela was extremely lucky. Lucky for being found in time, and lucky that no other vital organs were damaged. While the doctors saved Solangela's life, police hunted for her missing baby. For 24 hours, there was no sign of him. But then police received a tip-off. They were told that a woman had arrived home with a baby. A neighbor suspected it was not hers. Liz Miller was arrested. And yet again, it turned out that the accused was already a mother. She has six children, two boys and four girls aged between six and 15. They are now being cared for by their grandmother. I tell the children that their mother won't be here for a while, that she's done something she shouldn't have, that she was told to do it because she has never done something like this before. I'm 60, I had her when I was 24, and she's never done anything wrong in all her life. Liz Miller's ordinary family life and the fact that she is already a mother fits the profile of the other women who have committed this crime. It's not what most people expect. The assumptions that are made are that she can't have children or has never had children or has told that she can't have children, and that isn't true. We've certainly had women doing this who have had children, who have families, um, who may have voluntarily had a hysterectomy or something like that. The, the fixation is about something else. It's about controlling that, her world and another person in that world. And I think we have to look beyond the idea that this is about having a baby and seeing what's really going on with this person in terms of the, the psychological issues or instability that she may be experiencing that has taken the shape of getting a baby from somebody, but may in fact be pointing to some deeper issues. Liz Miller's case supports the conclusions drawn from Chicago and Alabama. A recurring feature in the lives of all these women is a fragile relationship with their partner. I think that she did all this because she thought she could lose me. 
24-year-old Alex Wulteros lived opposite Luzmila. They were having what he regarded as a casual relationship. He was 14 years younger and did not want to be tied down with a woman with six children. I was close to her, but not in love, because she was older than me. Well, people in the village used to look at us as we were walking around hugging. You know, there he goes with his mother. For me, maybe because of the age difference, she thought we didn't have a future together. In the Colombian case, I do believe that it's significant that the relationship had broken up only eight days previous. Desperate times call for desperate measures. For the person who's the perpetrator, it is her desperate time. It is her desperate measure. It may be something that only she relates to, but she crosses that threshold of saying, this is something that I believe I can, should, indeed must do, because I must maintain this relationship, this attachment, and this is what I see as the only way I can do it. My mom called me to tell me, Alex, Luzmila is here. So I went out and she told me, this is your son. And that let me thinking because I knew she'd had the operation. My mom said that she knew where Luzmila stole the baby from. As far as I'm concerned, everything was planned. Everything was planned. Once before, she told me she was pregnant, so I was waiting for a lie. I came over all cold inside. The baby was cut on the left arm in the shape of a V. I thought, oh my God, who is capable of doing this? I accused her of having stolen that baby and she said I was a witch. I just said only a psychopath was able to do something like that. With the trial in progress, Lesmila is sticking to her story. She had simply helped a woman in need. If found guilty, she will face a long prison sentence. And what do you think now? What do I think? That with the help of God, hopefully, one day I will get out of here. There is only one victim. When you couple narcissism with fetal abduction, what you have is a person who has created a self-centered world in which no one counts and there's no empathy, there's no sympathy, there's no sense that they are um, taking another person's life. That other person's life has no meaning for them. They're just there as instruments for the narcissist's gain. Ten days after being cut out of his mother's womb, baby Miguel was released from intensive care and reunited with his mother. I was very happy when they gave me back my baby. I hugged him, I kissed him, and I cried. I always knew God would give him back to me. It is perhaps Nicole, Solangela's daughter, who is finding it hardest to recover from the horror of that day. At the beginning, my daughter would start crying for no reason. She's become really aggressive and rude. Sometimes she even hits me. After what happened, we talked a lot. And now we must learn to leave it in the past. It was fate. Now we have to live our life and carry on believing in our love. I will love her forever. The horror of fetal theft is not just about the past. For the survivors, it's about the present and the future too. 
Not bad, not bad. Not bad for a little white girl from down the street. You know that? The challenge is to ensure that their traumatic entry into the world does not overshadow their future. It's not something that the kid should have to deal with, but me and him have to. And I think we're doing a pretty good job. It's been 10 years since Sam Evans' daughter, Debbie, was killed for her unborn child. That child, Elijah, is now nine years old. I survived from not, uh, I survived and I should have been uh, dead, but I wasn't, so they called me a miracle baby. The thing that saved Elijah was the fact that the placenta was in the wrong place. So when they took the scissors and the knife and cut, uh, they actually were cutting on the placenta. Had it been in the right place, they probably would have been cutting Eli, so he probably would not have survived. Elijah's brother, Jordan, was 19 months old when he saw the people he calls the bad guys murder his mother and take baby Elijah. He spent six hours alone in the apartment with his dead mother. Not only did they hurt us, or, but they hurt the rest of our family, and I'm sure it hurt my mom, brother, and sister, a lot more than what it hurt us. I kept thinking that Elijah and Jordan were being cheated, that I knew that from that point on there was no way things would be normal. I can remember making a promise to Debbie at that point that, uh, uh, that I would try my hardest to, to love him just like I loved her. I just felt like, you know, they're going to come and I'm going to take them. They're going to live with me. I'll raise them. I raise their mother and I'll raise them. I am 11 years old and I am 9 years old. We're two years difference. Yes, because he's two years older than me. And I like the thought of being older than him. And I would like the thought of being older than him, but I'm small. So I can actually uh, if I get hurt, then it's his fault because he's the older brother and he wasn't taking care of me. So that's why I like being little. Elijah and Jordan have grown up six hours' drive south of Chicago. From the beginning, their grandfather Sam was aware that he needed to help them to understand their trauma. I can remember a day when uh, I, I heard him telling uh, Eli what had happened. And I'm going, wow. <laughs> uh, but he explained that these bad guys came in and I mean, he just explained it in detail. And I just sat there listening, and I, my heart was just, I just, it just broke my heart. And so it was at that point that I realized that this was something that we just needed to talk about on an ongoing basis. Boy, the first two, three years, uh, Jordan had oh. nightmares every night, and he would come in by me crying, and or I'd go in by him because I could hear him hollering at night. Sometimes I'd wake up in the middle of the night thinking I heard something and I had Eli's baby bed in my room and, uh, and Jordan would be standing there just patting him, talking to him, letting him know he was okay. And yes. It was really tough. It was really tough. And, and now he gets a little upset because he doesn't remember. And I've tried to assure Jordan that his mother would be happy that he, that he didn't remember the nightmare, that that, uh, that, that was a good thing. Being a big brother, like, I should be able to remember. I mean, I was there, but I can't remember anything. And I just hope that my mom isn't disappointed in me. He doesn't have to remember to tell me 
I could probably figure it out from Grandpa if he can answer the questions. But I know that he's not guilty. Somewhere, they're going to come face to face with the idea that, hey, my mom, my sister, my brother, they were all murdered. Uh, you know, why did they kill me? And I, and I'm afraid they're going to feel guilty about it. But from day to day and, and on an ongoing basis, the less concern I am about it. Because it's, it's who they are. We talk about it. Hey, it's who you are. This is your life. This is what happened to you. <laughs> when I think about the fact that, like, she was murdered, it sort of makes me feel sad. But there is times when I get mad. Uh, uh, it makes me mad to think that somebody would take their lives. I usually go like that. It's not something that the kid should have to deal with, but <laughs> me and him have to. As much as we fight and stuff, we still love each other, and we probably always will. And me and him work as a team, and our grandpa do, and the rest of our family to get through this. and. Well, we're getting through it. That's it!